Okay, Bill, whenever you're ready. Unless you want to give folks a couple more minutes. I guess we can start whenever. Is it recording yet? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. okay, well, I'm going to talk about totals counting today. Uh, most of the stuff that I'm talking about is actually found in the Panda Manual. Not that much of the uh, basic uh, principles have changed since that was written. Uh, some of the applications I'll talk about at the end are not in the Panda Manual, although some of them are. So, so basically what I'm going to talk about is uh, give a brief introduction. I'll spend some time talking about how neutrons are produced in plutonium and uranium samples. Um, and then I'll talk about some things that can cause us problems when we do totals counting. That's if you have impurities in there or if the sample is multiplying. Um, and I'll talk uh, quite a bit about multiplication, so hopefully people have a better understanding of the difference between multiplication and leakage multiplication and some other things there. Um, briefly talk about what we want to look at when we design a detector for total counting. Um, and then I'll spend some time talking about different types of instruments and some applications and just give you a brief summary. So let's get into it. And uh, <coughs> uh, introduction to total neutron, neutron counting. Um, basically, when you do total counting, you're counting all the events from a detector. So you don't care how those neutrons were produced. They could be from spontaneous fission, induced fission, alpha N. So, you know, we're counting all those uh, events from the detector, and we're not discriminating between the different types of events. Um, systems to count uh, neutrons uh, can be very simple. All you really need is a detector, a discriminator to discriminate against gamma versus neutron, and a scaler. You don't even need a computer, but you know, to most often these days systems do have computers with them. Um, and again, since we're counting all the events from the detector, we're not getting any information about the neutron source. We don't know what the energy was of it. We don't know where it came from. Just that we counted a neutron. And so that leads to a pretty simple description of counting totals. <coughs> basically, we're just, our, the total count rate that we measure in a detector is basically your efficiency times your source, whatever that is. And then if the source is big enough, you might have some multiplication <coughs> effect in there. Um, so this source term includes, you know, spontaneous fission, alpha N, uh, neutrons from impurity. So, uh, but it's a pretty simple description. Um, and usually when one is counting total neutrons, since you don't really have any information about the detector, you usually require some knowledge about your source. Because otherwise, somebody could put a different source in front of you and you might get the rate that you're expecting and then you, you know, so there needs to be some sort of administrative control so that way you know what you're measuring. Um, just a, a quick uh, comparison between totals and coincidence counting. Um, coincidence counting is where you actually count neutrons in coincidence. So uh, that type of counting is only sensitive to spontaneous fission or induced fission or events where neutrons are produced in coincidence. Um, and so I just wanted to give a, a brief uh, pros and cons for, for both uh, counting methods. Uh, you know, I'm only talking about totals today. And total counting is sensitive to alpha N, spontaneous fission, and induced fission neutrons, whereas coincidence counting is sensitive to only spontaneous fission and induced fission. So you basically are now trying, you're discriminating between some of your sources, and so um, that's a plus up on coincidence counting. Um, if you compare total counting compared to coincidence counting, it's less sensitive to the induced fission neutrons and also less sensitive to changes in the detection efficiency. That's because totals, you can think totals, you're just counting the efficiency. When you count coincident neutrons, you're counting the efficiency squared. So changes in efficiency, or uh, if you have multiplication, you're going to be more sensitive to that when you're counting coincident neutrons. And of course, one big downside of totals counting is that you're very sensitive to changes in background. Uh, background is usually random uncorrelated neutrons. And so, any, if your background changes, your total count rate is going to change, and so that could lead to a bias. Whereas coincidence counting is pretty insensitive to changes in background because you're counting coincident neutrons and neutrons and coincidence in background, as I said, is generally uh, just random events being produced. Um, totals counting does yield better counting pre precision. You're just counting the total neutrons uh, 
where it's coincident counting, again, kind of coincident neutrons just goes up to efficiency squared. Often, also in total counting, you're you're using uh, the fact that the sample produces alpha n neutrons, which which increase your count rate a lot. So you can get very good precision in in, in much better in the same amount of time than for coincidence counting. Uh, let's look at some of the uh, basically how some of the neutron sources for uh, total counting. And so these are uh, listed here are. Um, spontaneous fission and alpha N, those are the primary neutron sources. A uh, secondary source would be like induced fission. Uh, those are neutrons are made at a much smaller rate. Uh, but let's just first look at uranium. I highlighted these uh, U-235 and U-238 isotopes in red because those tend to be the most dominant or, or most abundant isotopes in a uranium sample. And so if we're looking at just spontaneous fission, um, these are pretty small. These are the neutrons uh, per second per gram of uh, neutrons emitted in, uh, for these isotopes of uranium. You can see that U-238 has the you know, largest number of neutrons emitted, so that's going to be the most important isotope. And also, that's one of the more abundant ones in a uranium sample. Um, if you look at the alpha N rate, so this is alpha N for an uh, for an oxide sample, so if you had uranium oxide, um, you can see all these numbers here are pretty small. The largest number here is 3, which is for U-234. So U-234, um, um, you would produce 3 alpha n's if you had 1 gram of that U-234. Uh, um, even though U-234 isn't abundant very much in uranium, that's really the most important contributor. It's 5,000 times larger than U-235 here. And so, you know, you only need a little bit of U-234 in your sample, and it will totally outwhelm the rate of alpha N production from U-235. So this is one of the most important alpha N producers for uranium, is U-234, the U-234 isotope. Plutonium, on the other hand, uh, is much more active, um, and PU-239 and PU-240 are, are some of the most abundant uh, isotopes in plutonium. And so for spontaneous fission, you can see all the even isotopes give you uh, a substantial count rate. It turns out PU-240 is going to give you most of the count rate from spontaneous fission, just because that's in the sample a lot. But you can't, uh, you also need to account for 238 and 242, because those also contribute a uh, fraction to your um, count rate. Um, for, uh, for the alpha N part of the equation, um, PU239 and PU240 are important. They have a, a you know a appreciable count rate there. PU238 is much larger, so so that is important also. You have to account for that one, even though that isn't usually in uh, PU samples to a huge amount of that material. Um, so. You know, sort of in summary, for spontaneous fission of uranium, it's U-238, the importance. Uh, for alpha N of uranium, U-234 is important. And then for spontaneous fission in plutonium, it's all the even isotopes are important. And then for alpha N production, it's these three top, U-238, or PU-238, PU-239, and PU-240. Um, so let's uh, go and look at now just the plutonium side in, in a little more detail. So when you're doing total coincidence counting, uh, you sort of require a knowledge beforehand to know what your count rate would be of the chemical form and the isotopic composition. Um, and that's because the, for, for the spontaneous visions, you need to know the isotopic composition. That will tell you how many neutrons you'll get per gram of that thing, of that material. For the alpha N rate, you need to know both the chemical form and the isotopic composition. You need to know if it's a plutonium oxide, or plutonium chloride, or some other type of plutonium sample, because those alpha N reactions depend upon what light the element is in, uh, is in your chemical form of plutonium. So now let's just look at some count rates and, and look at uh, the neutron production for, say, two different isotopes of plutonium, if you have 100 grams of it, and we'll look at metal, plutonium oxide, and plutonium fluoride, um, PUS4 here. 
So here, shown in this table now is you know two different isotopics, the, the top isotopics, bottom isotopics. If we look at the first column here, this just gives you the number of neutrons produced from spontaneous fission, the count rate, neutrons per second, for 100 grams of, of plutonium. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, PD248 is the important one here. Um, when the isotopics change, you know, PD240 is higher here, but also PD238 and PD242 is starting to give you substantial amounts from spontaneous fission. Um, the next two columns give us the alpha N rates. This is for plutonium oxide and this is for plutonium chloride. And again, the top three of plutonium, P238, 239, 240, are the important contributors. And same thing down here. Um, one thing I didn't point out on the previous slide, it wasn't on there, but americium 241, which is always found in plutonium and grows into plutonium as plutonium gets older, is also a very substantial alpha N or an alpha emitter, and so that makes a lot of alpha N neutrons. So that has to be included also. You can see this; these numbers are starting to get pretty comparable with these, although still PU238 has, has the biggest contribution. Well, not down here. It's pretty small, but you have to account for those three. Yeah? Could you tell me just the PU fluoride, plutonium fluoride, is this I understand plutonium oxide that uh, is used, uh, but yeah. fluoride is, is complex gum. Is that abundant throughout the DNA yeah. complex? I guess it probably isn't. I can't think of instances where it's around, but I'm sure it's around somewhere. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you know, another thing just to keep in mind, this also just gives you some ideas of yeah. count rates. Yeah, uh, uranium, you know, fluoride is much more yeah. probable. Um, so again, plutonium metal, P243 produces the majority of the neutrons. Um, if you're counting the total neutron, uh, total neutrons from a mass of plutonium metal, you can count something called the P240 effective mass, which in essence is the uh, mass of P240 that you would get if all the uh, spontaneous fission element or isotopes of plutonium was PU240. So um, the P240 effective is defined as this equation here. And these uh, constants in front of the 238 and 242 are basically just the ratios of the count rates relative to PU240. So if you didn't know the isotopics, but it was metals, you could measure this quantity of PU240 effective. Once you know the isotopics, then you can convert that to a total mass. Um, so, you know, you can take this equation here, our total rates equal to some calibration constant times our P240 effective. This calibration constant has things like the efficiency of your detection efficiency for that, you know, how far away your detector is from your sample, you know, all those uh, quantities are folded into that K0. But then you can also make a, a, a different calibration here, K1. Now, this K1 has this isotopic information included into it in addition to all the information that K0 has. Um, one big uh, assumption here is that we have a multiplication of 1, which for plutonium metal is not true, only for the very, very smallest mass of the plutonium. And I'll, we'll come back to this and see what sort of biases that causes in a little bit. Um, plutonium oxide, uh, both spontaneous fission and alpha ends are important in this. Um, if we if I quickly scroll back two slides, you can see for plutonium oxide, basically if you have plutonium oxide, uh, what count rate you're going to get is the sum of these two columns. This column is just the alpha N rate, this is the spontaneous fission rate. You can see the uh, plutonium oxide, you know, about a third of your neutrons or so, you know, depending upon the enrichment uh, or the isotopics, you know, contribute a third to a half. Sometimes it might be one to one. but so. You have to con uh, take into account both the spontaneous fission and the alpha N neutron. Um, the neutron production in plutonium oxide can be described by this equation. And so uh, basically your count rate is determining on the isotope isotopics of these quantities here, where these constants, these A's in front, depend upon the neutron production rates from spontaneous fission and alpha N reaction. So like this A5 would just be an alpha N 
contributor. Whereas the uh, like P240, you have to, all these A's here are both alpha N and spontaneous E. And again, we can get, you know, the total plutonium mass, if you know the isotopics, um, you can calculate what our count rate should be. Um, uh, PU is the total plutonium mass, and this K is, again, a calibration constant. So, you know, our total count rate is equal to something like the efficiency times the uh, count per second per gram, which is what this equation gives you, times the mass of plutonium. So, you know, just using this simple equation, again, you can get, uh, assuming the detector is calibrated, you can use that to measure the mass of plutonium. And again, this assumes a multiplication of one, which, you know, for plutonium oxide, is cl closer to the truth, although if you start to get big enough mass oxides, your multiplication is not going to be close to one. So. Uh, plutonium fluoride, um, if you look at plutonium fluoride, basically alpha N reactions produce the majority of the neutrons. Let me do a, another quick scroll back here again. Uh, look at, you know, for plutonium fluoride, uh, spontaneous fission produces 10,000, but the PUF4 is close to a million. So you have uh, a 1% effect by not including the spontaneous fission. And it's even smaller for, this, uh, for these isotopics there. Yeah. So, you know, to 1%, then you can uh, sort of write down this equation here, which de describes the count rate of, uh, for a PUF4 sample, where now these quantities, these A quantities here, just depend upon the neutron production from alpha N reactions. So we're sort of ignoring that 1% for the spontaneous fission. And, but you could easily include that in these, uh, in, you know, you can include those terms in there too if you really want to. Um, and then again, the plutonium mass, same sort of thing. The totals rate equal to some calibration constant. You know, that includes the efficiency times the count rate per gram of plutonium fluoride times the mass of the plutonium fluoride. And again, this assumes a multiplication of one. Now let's uh, look at uranium. Um, so that, you know, that plutonium, there's sort of like three examples there. One, spontaneous fission was important. The other one, you have to account for both spontaneous fission and alpha N. And the last one is, was more just alpha N. You didn't really have to worry about the spontaneous fission. So when you're determining the plutonium item you're measuring, you, you know, you need to see where, where are my source terms coming from and make sure you include all those elements in there. Same thing's true for uranium. Um, very similar plutonium. Again, you need to know the chemical form and enrichment. Uh, you know, the same principles for neutron production, except that, you know, as we saw earlier, the neutron production rates are much smaller for uranium. So, you know, uh, several orders of magnitude less count rates you get from uranium than from plutonium. So let's look now at uh, the count rates from uranium metal, uranium oxide, and uranium fluoride, or UF6 here. Um, and we're going to use 10 kilograms of material to calculate these count rates. You know, for the plutonium, we use 100 grams, <coughs> and uh, just gives you an idea of the magnitude of the differences in count rates. So here's three different enrichments, uh, low enrichment up to high enrichment. And again, we have the metal, the spontaneous fission. Um, as we saw, U238 is the important spontaneous fission uh, producer in this you know, if you have 10 kilograms of uranium, you're only getting 136 neutrons per second out. So it's not big, but that can be measured. Um, as the enrichment increases, basically your spontaneous fission neutron rate goes very small. So when you have high enriched uranium, you really can't measure this um, with total counting. You only have five counts, five neutrons per second for 100 grams of uranium of high enriched, and your backgrounds are probably going to be larger than that. So um, really the only hope of measuring uranium metal is with the lower enriched or depleted uranium. <coughs> Although that's not as interesting because people are really interested in measuring U-235. If you don't have any U-235, it's not as interesting to measure. Um, if you have, uh, now let's look at the alpha N rates. Um, so this is uranium oxide alpha N rates um, for low enriched uh, 
uranium oxide doesn't really emit anything. You have to get up to the higher rich before that starts emitting stuff. Again, remember I said earlier that U-234 is the important contributor to that. You can see here it's 310, 42 here. Um, and then UF6, you know, fluoride has a much higher cross-section for the alpha N reaction, so those rates are always larger. But still, you know, you're not super high count rates. And then when you get up to to the high enriched, the, the U-234 is very important, I think. Um, so we'll go on. Uh, uranium metal, the spontaneous fission of U-238 dominates neutron produ uh, production for enrichment below 7%. I already mentioned that. Uh, for highly enriched uh, uranium metal, uh, basically you don't have enough neutron production to make that measurement uh, for a practical measurement. Um, and then, since we have such small count rates, uh, we really require long count time to get good uh, statistical precision. And also, it's really only practical for large, large masses, you know. You have a, a one kilogram sample, even if it depleted uranium, your count rate is going to still be pretty small there. Um, but assuming that you have low enriched metal, then you can again just use a, a linear calibration curve. We've seen those before. Um, again, this assumes that you don't have any multiplication in your sample. Uh, small mass or high enriched samples are more amenable to active NDA measurements, and I'm sure we'll really talk about that sometime in the future. Uranium oxide, uh, the neutron production for uranium oxide tends to be nearly constant for enrichment below 60%. And uh, you can see that just by sort of looking here. If you add these two up, we have 137, you add these two up, you have, what, 139. Um, so these two rates sort of compensate for each other, the alpha N and the, the spontaneous fission rate, to give you a pretty much constant enrichment when, you, or I'm sorry, a pretty nearly constant count rate when the enrichment is less than 60%. When you get above that, the count rate increases. Um, again, U-234 is the important alpha N producer in uranium. Um, and same sort of thing, we can uh, write out a count rate here where these, uh, quantities in front of our uh, different isotopes depend upon the spontaneous fission and alpha N reactions. You know, this is spontaneous fission, alpha N here. Um, and then same sort of uh, calibration for that or, or equation there. Um, uranium oxide is often found in cans and like fuel rods and stuff in small quantities that are better suited for like active count rates than for passive. Um, Large uranium oxide samples, uh, you can use those to uh, for passive counting, depending upon what the sample characteristics are in the measurement goal. And then UF6, you know, same thing before. Here, alpha N reactions dominate the uh, <coughs> neutron production mechanism. And so the <coughs> neutron production is described in a similar way to the oxide case where all those terms are basically just going to depend upon the, the alpha N reaction rate. Um, totals neutron counting is often used for verification of UF6 donors. We'll see some examples of that later when I get to that point. So uh, here's just a graphical form of those uh, production rates. So this is the neutron production rate in neutrons per second per gram. And so this is the combined rate for both spontaneous fission and alpha N. Um, these bottom three curves are the uh, for uranium metal, uranium oxide, and uranium UF6. Um, and here's the U235 percentage of those. So you can see these count rates are all pretty small. This is a large scale. 10 to the minus 2, UF6 actually gets above uh, 10 to the 0, or above 1 there. Um, and then the, the plutonium isotopes, again, or plutonium is much uh, higher count rate. Anybody have any questions about that so far? The only question I have is I'm, I'm still new to the starter production stuff. Um, if you have a uranium sample that doesn't have any plutonium in it, is, uh, is 
and the Region 241 generated out of that no. process? No. So it's just coming from the plutonium? Yeah, T241, I believe. The uh, Amory 241. Okay. So uranium actually, you know, it, its camera is just so small. It, it's the K time. It's the K lifetime is very large. So um, if you have a sample of uranium today, in 20 years, basically the, like, the enrichment is going to be the same. You know, it's just so slow to decay. So what, you know, what problems can we have measuring? You know, I gave, we just saw all these nice linear calibration curves and all this stuff looks really nice, but in reality, uh, it doesn't work out quite that well because material often is not very extremely pure. Usually there's some impurities mixed in with it. Um, so, you know, usually you find, find some impurities in there such as water. You can have some moisture mixed in with your uh, uh, material. Um, and then low Z elements like fluorine, beryllium, carbon, and other low Z elements. Any low Z element that has, that's able to capture an alpha particle and produce a, a neutron, the alpha end uh, reaction. All those can uh, contribute to your neutron count rate. And so if you expect to get a certain count rate from just that material, that count rate is going to change some because of impurities. And usually it's going to increase. Oh, it usually always results in an increase in the neutron production. Um, let's look at some examples of, say, water and fluorine to see how that would affect our neutron count rate. To give you an idea of the magnitude of uh, some of these corrections. And so, shown here is a graph of uh, the neutron production rate in neutrons per second per gram. This is for plutonium uh, versus the water in the plutonium. So this is the weight percent water. So this goes from zero, which would be no water at all, um, up to 10 here. And these three different uh, basically isotopic. So this is plutonium 240, 10%, 16%, and 25%. You can see that as you add more water, your uh, count rate increases just because you have more oxygen in there that uh, the alphas can hit and make alpha N reactions. Um, and how much does this actually affect? You know, here's here's the ideal case with no water. So you can see that you know you're going from 60 counts a second maybe to 80 so counts at at 10% water. Often uh, in a facility you're going to find. Uh, if you do find water in your sample, it's going to be down here in this low range, less than 2%, maybe 1% or something. But, um, so this sort of shows now the same thing, water down here, how much water you have in there, versus the relative uh, neutron production rate between no water in your sample to well, however much water here. So you can see if you have no water, you have no bias. That's one in the relative difference between them. As you add water, uh, that goes up and you can, you know, get up to a 30 to 40 percent bias if you have 10 percent weight in water. Um, but usually, again, we're down here in this range. So usually around, you know, maybe 3, 4, 5 percent bias is there. Uh, all three of those different isotopics fall onto that single curve, um, which is sort of nice. Um, and here, if you have one weight percent water, you'll be biased about 4.5 percent and it'll increase the neutron production rate by that much. Yeah? This might be silly, but how did they do this measurement? Did they just put the, the samples in a container? These are calculations, actually. Okay. These are calculations, here. So, and you can, uh, there's uh, codes that uh, <coughs> uh, describe the chemical form, and it will tell you what your alpha end rates will be. So. How close are these calculated values to what's observed? They work pretty good. Uh, so I think, I mean, they've definitely been benchmarked and stuff, so they they should be pretty good to more better than a percent, I would guess, but I don't know for sure on that answer. So. I'm wondering if, you know, for some of those samples, whether the water is actually a uniform distribution in the matrix anyway. Yeah, yeah. and that would... And uh, most folks are probably assume oh, something yeah. like that. So. No, those are all valid points, you know, nothing... Nothing's exactly has, uh, how you uh, describe it, you know. I, 
started with you know the perfectly pure samples, but now we're now we're moving to this, and certainly you know you're going to have samples that are lumpy and whatever else, which will totally change change your answers also. One thing that sort of saves you here, though, is if you're making a, a measurements with items that let's say they have some water in them, right? If you do your calibration and uh, figure out what your calibration is with with those samples, the ones that have good measurements on them, maybe destructive analysis and stuff, and then start measuring. So your calibration curve, in essence, your calibration parameter is going to include these effects in it. As long as you're you're measuring items that are representative of the ones you calibrated with, effects like this and effects of multiplication and impurities and all that will sort of be included in it when you start deviating from that. So even though this shows maybe a, a you know, if you had 1% weight water, I'd say you're going to have a 4% bias. If you calibrated with something with a 1% weight water, now that small variations in all your other samples will maybe give you a 1% bias. So. so it's important, you know, especially for any type of counting, but especially total counting, to have some sort of control on what you're measuring. Practically speaking, does anybody do counting with samples that have no weight percentages of water? Um, I don't know. I'm sure that uh, if you do destructive analysis, you can determine how much water is in there. Right. But they don't do destructive analysis on every item. So they just go ahead and pull all that into the calibration coefficient. Yeah. But very often, won't you be doing a set of measurements on a known group, say from the same process exactly. stream, and then you can pull out some of those and do a separate set of measurements at, and make those working standards, then you can go back and look at you know, your set of 100 items or something yeah. like that without ever knowing exactly, for example, how much water is typically in any of those. Yeah. You know, as I said, if your if your unknowns are representative of your of what you use to calibrate, then things like this will be folded into the calibration curve. And you know, I say unknown, well, you don't know what it is, but if it's if, again, if it's coming off the same line or you know gone through the same process to make it, it's probably pretty representative of the standard if your standard went through that same process. Um, so the same thing happens with if you add impurities in there. Basically, um, again, here's showing how much fluorine you have in a sample versus uh, the, the neutron production rate from that sample. So this is a plutonium sample, plutonium oxide sample, um, and so as you as your fluorine increases in that sample, your count rate's going to increase. This is two different amounts of water in your sample. Again, these are all just calculations. If you have no fluorine, you, your count rates are down here, and then they start to increase as you add fluorine. This is a harder one, I think, it, when you have impurities, because often you don't know how much impurities you have. Even if you do the destructive analysis <coughs> on a bunch of samples, they'll probably differ some in each sample. So um, how much of a, of a bias will that cause? Well, here's, here's our sort of relative difference between no fluorine and fluorine versus fluorine. And it all just depends how much fluorine you have in your sample. Um, you know, if you have small amounts, you know, just trace impurities from the production, they're probably down here in that small range, so a couple percent. Um, yeah, I think you really have to work hard or be really sloppy to get up here when you're doing a process. <coughs> so, is there any questions about the, those impurities and stuff? Let me talk about, about multiplication now. Um, Any time you have plutonium and uranium, they, you can induce fission in there. So you're always going to have multiplication to some extent. Um, and when you induce fission, basically all you're going to do to your total count rate is you're going to add counts to it. So you're going to have ne more neutrons around. So um, the multiplication is always going to add neutrons. Let's uh, define what multiplication is. It's basically the number of neutrons created in the sample divided by the number of neutrons that you started with. So if I have X number of neutrons from spontaneous fission and I make Y neutrons uh, in inducing fissions from those, then my multiplication is going to be my X plus Y divided by Y, or X divided by the number. 
Um, but we're not really interested. The multiplication is an important quantity, but we don't actually measure that. What we actually measure is the leakage multiplication. Um, and that, is, that this takes into account uh, creation and loss in the, the, in the sample due to fission and then other ways you can lose neutrons, other ways you can capture. So the leakage multiplication really is the number of neutrons that escape the sample uh, per neutron produced. So it's telling us, you know, that's what we actually measure. We're measuring the neutrons that escape the sample, not the neutrons inside the sample. Um, to, to understand this a little better, let me just define these quantities here. Um, we can define the nu, which is the average number of neutrons produced per, per induced fission. So that's like uh, two and a half or so for uranium and about three for plutonium. So on average, that's how many neutrons you produce when you induce a fission. P is the probability to induce a fission. Um, P sub C here is the probability to be captured. And this capture, so it's just captured on anything in the sample besides making a fission. Sometimes you can say you capture and make a fission, but this probability does not include uh, fissioning and all the other captures. And then P sub L is the probability to escape the sample, to leak out of the sample. And so basically these are the three things that I'm defining that can happen in my sample. So if I add those three probabilities up, they have to equal one. So let's now look at a numerical example of multiplication. Let's, set, let's assume here that the probability to induce a fission is 10%. And when I do induce a fission, on average, I make three neutrons. Okay? And so uh, in my zero generation, let's say that I start with 100 neutrons, or 1,000 neutrons. So basically, I look at my sample, and from the spontaneous fissions, there's 1,000 neutrons inside that sample. Um, so there's 1,000 neutrons, and then I can define something as the net neutron profit, which is also 1,000. And that, you can sort of think of that as how many neutrons are, are in the sample. So I have 1,000 spontaneous fissions, I have 1,000 net neutron profit are in the sample. Um, the first generation, again, I have a 10% chance to induce a fission. So from those 1,000 neutrons, I'm going to induce 100 fissions. From those 100 <coughs> fissions, since, it, since I make three neutrons per fission, I'm going to make 300 neutrons, <coughs> OK? But my net neutron profit isn't going to be 300 because I've lost 100 of these neutrons to make the fission. So really, I only have 200 more neutrons in my sample, OK? And so, and then you can continue this. You know, now I have 300 neutrons, 10% chance I get 30 neutrons, that I, or 30 more induced fission, and then make 90 more neutrons. And my net neutron profit would be 60. And so you can keep going on and on until all your neutrons die away. So after about six generations, in this case, now we're getting down to, to zero, close to zero. So if I add up all the neutrons that I created, I get 1,428. And I started with 1,000. So if I divide those two, that's my multiplication. So it's 1.428. Um, if I add up all my net neutron profit, I basically I have 1,286 neutrons in my sample. If all those escape, let's say the, the probability to capture is zero. So all those neutrons escape. That's how many neutrons I have to measure. This is how many I started. So my leakage multiplication would be 1.286. So you can see these two quantities are different. And, but this is the quantity we're interested in. That's what we're measuring. Let's now look at this um, in this form here uh, with our symbols and say, and do the same thing. I start with one neutron. So how many fissions will I make? Well, it's, that, it's one times the probability to induce a fission. So I'll have p fissions. How many neutrons will I create? It's p times the average number of neutrons made. So I have p nu. And what would be my net neutron profit? Well, it takes one neutron to induce a fission, so it would be p times nu minus 1. And so now you can continue doing this. Now I have p nu neutrons times p will give me how many fissions. 
Uh, times new will give me how many neutrons created, and then this times new minus one will give me my net neutron profit. So if I continue doing this, um, and you know this is just going to go on forever, right? And so I'm going to have this big series to sum up to get how many neutrons I created. Turns out that's a nice geometric series, and it, it just simplifies down to this. Assuming that p times nu is less than 1, which is uh, generally a, a good assumption, or always a good assumption. Um, so this is the equation for multiplication in the sample. It's just 1 divided by p times nu. Um, and then the net neutron profit, if I sum all that up, I'm going to get this equation here, 1 minus uh, p divided by 1 minus p nu. And so, um, if I go back to that previous example I just showed and put in p equals 0.01, 10% chance to induce fission, and three neutrons per average made, I get a multiplication of 1.429. And again, assuming no capture, I get a, multi a leakage multiplication of 1.286. And that agrees exactly, or just about exactly, with these numbers. So it's nice to know the infinity is equal to 6. Yes. So this is all good. And, but, you know, I've ignored capture, right? Capture happens, so how do we take capture into account? Well, what, I, what is the leakage multiplication? It's related to the neutron, the, the net neutron profit. That's how many neutrons are in my sample, right? Times this quantity here. And this quantity basically is saying, what fraction of those neutrons in my sample will leak out, right? And the only two things, so, so I have some leakage probability, but that has to be normalized to the two other things, the two things that can happen. is It can leak out or it can capture. The, uh, the probability of fission is already included in this term, in that term there. So if I take this and I, I notice that PL plus P sub C is equal to 1 minus P from that, that unity equation that I showed at the beginning, I, this simplifies to this right here. And I know 1 minus p nu is equal, 1 over 1 minus p nu is equal to m. So basically my leakage multiplication is just equal to my probability to leak times the multiplication. And so that's a nice little equation there. And again, if I expand this out, I get this equation here. And if pc goes to 0, well, now I just get my net neutron property. So this is all good, and I just showed you all these equations, and you're probably bored now, but what does this really mean for what we see when we do totals counting? Well, um, these are some of the, the leakage multiplications that we'll see. For um, These are calculations here. This bottom curve is sort of representative of uranium, so that's a, a new of 2.5. The top curve here is representative of plutonium with a new of 3. And uh, the solid curve is no capture, and these other two dotted lines correspond to, you know, one or two percent probability to be captured in the sample. Um, and this is plotted versus the fission probability. The fission probability is is going to be dependent upon things such as the sample type, the density, the geometry. Um, it's basically a probability to be inducing a fission, right? So if you have an oxide which isn't very dense, those neutrons can easily escape. Whereas a metal, which is very dense, those neutrons have a better chance of inducing a fission. So for a metal, the probability would be higher than for an oxide. And similarly, like a shape, if you have a, a sphere and a neutron is born in that center of that sphere, it has to travel through a lot of material before it can get out. So that would have a high probability of inducing a fission versus like a flat pancake. If you neutron is born in the middle of a flat pancake, it can easily escape out the side only when it travels along the length of it that it will have a high probability. So that geometry will have a much lower probability. Um, so, um, yes? P sub C is equal to uh, temperature. Yes. Yeah. P sub C varies with temperature. So have you noticed effects on... Um, um, that's just the sort of capture probability, to capture a neutron. Right. And so that's not going to vary very big on temperature. It's just a cross-section. Yeah, I guess I guess what I'm thinking about is that, you know practical applications since I haven't been yeah. here long. Uh, you know whether your samples have varying different amounts of temperature, but as the temperature changes in a physical material, that you get uh, more resonance absorption. 
from South or Vermont and stuff. So I was just wondering if, if that really has an impact in um, the kind of counting you put. That might impact gamma rays, but I don't think it does neutron speed. Do you know anything about that, Mark? Are, are, are you speaking from, say, your reactor experience? Well, yeah. You, if, if you have temperature changes in physical, physical material, as fast neutrons slow down the thermal ranges, they go through an epithermal uh, energy spectrum. And you, I know particularly U-238, uh, as it heats up, the uh, uh, epithermal capture probability increases because of Doppler broadening as the heat increases. So I was just curious what kind of, you know, like some of your visionable material may capture range the temperature ranges. Temperature ranges yeah. Yeah. yeah, here we're just talking about room temperature, room temperature. going down to air conditioning temperature and stuff. So gotcha. Okay, yeah. that's that's what I was trying to, yeah. Yeah. to figure out. Okay. I guess if you had some really weird situation that probably doesn't happen very often, that might be an issue. Um, so yeah, so this just sort of gives you an idea of the magnitude of these effects. You know, this is a 10%, 20%, 30% effect. Um, you know, typical oxides have pretty small multiplications, you know, of, of less than three or four percent. Um, if you have, you know, certainly there could be forms and shapes where you get higher. Uh, and then metal, like plutonium metal, you can, you know, I've seen a twenty percent multiplications and stuff, so those can get much higher. Which, if you're up at twenty percent, you definitely have to take that into account if you're just counting total. Um, and here's, uh, this is another calculation of the multiplication versus plutonium oxide mass. So here we have plutonium oxide mass and multiplication. This goes from zero to a kilogram. Um, this is for a cylindrical volume of plutonium oxide with a density of 1.3 grams per cubic centimeter and a can diameter of about 8 centimeters. Um, and you can see that as your, here's your leakage multiplication, that's what we're actually measuring. As we go up to, you know, 1,000 grams, now we're up to about 5% leakage multiplication in this case. So, but again, if, if you calibrated with uh, a couple different masses of plutonium oxide, you're going to, you know, before I said you have these nice linear curves, you won't have a linear curve here because of the multiplication. But if you calibrated, with several different standards, the total rate versus the mass, then uh, this this bias is included in your calibration. And then you'll more be concerned about, well, did my geometry change? So maybe now my multiplications changed because the geometry changed from what I calibrated with. But even so, that won't be as big a, nearly as big a magnitude as if you had somehow had a calibration assuming multiplication was wrong. Are there any questions on that multiplication issues? I'll uh, briefly talk about detector design here. Um, when you are designing a detector, there's several things that you need to take into account. One is what the leakage spectra of the source would look like. What's the energy spectra coming out? Because you, know? you might have uh, spontaneous fissions, which give you uh, a distribution of energies, and then alpha n energies can be uh, differing energies also. So you have a lot of different energies. You need to sort of have some idea what that spectra would look like. That way, when you try to maximize your de detection efficiency, you're going to do that by designing, like if you have helium-3 tubes, how do you moderate, how much moderation do you need, what arrangement do you want to put those tubes in. And so if you know what the spectrum looks like, you can easily de or design that much easier. Typically, these days, all this designing of a counter is done with uh, Monte Carlo. Um, another important thing is, what's my potential background? Uh, do I need to worry about background? If not, if I don't, then you know I don't have to worry about shielding the detector. But if so, I need to shield my detector. Um, do I try to make my detector so it's more efficient in one direction versus another direction? So all those things need to be taken into account. And of course, you've got the practical things. What's my cost for versus performance? I can probably make a really good detector, but maybe the person doesn't want to pay that much for that detector. So those two have to be uh, uh, 
put against each other. And then, you know, do they want a detector that's portable or fixed, you know? So if you have a portable detector, it's going to be a lot harder to shield against background radiation because you want to make something you can move around. Whereas a fixed detector, you can just put a lot of shielding in. You know, there's other things to consider when designing a detector. That's sort of just a brief overview there. Um, now I'm going to talk about some instruments and applications here. Um, the instruments, you know, these are some generalizations here. It doesn't mean that they're always true, but usually they're simple and easy to operate. Again, we're just counting totals. All you need is a discriminator, a detector discriminator, and a scaler to count them. Um, again, I, I've mentioned this already. They're less sensitive to multiplication and efficiency variation than, say, coincidence counters. Um, again, we're unable to discriminate neutron energy or production sources. And they're usually made with helium-3 tubes, and those can have efficiencies, say, up to 20% or so, although they can be higher, often or lower than that. Um, and also, for the applications, usually you need to have administrative control to ensure that whatever we're measuring is appropriate material to be assayed with that detector. You know, if you make your calibration curve for uranium and somebody you know, brings out a small California source, you may still get the same count rate that you expect. And you say, oh yeah, that's uranium. But, so you need to have, you know, the administrative control to make sure only those types of materials are brought to that count rate. Some of the applications include, say, like verifying plutonium metal, verifying uranium, US-6 cylinders or enrichment, measuring uh, low enriched uranium, uranium uh, things like moisture monitoring, measuring how much moisture. So let me you know, start with like a really simple detector and work our way up to more sophisticated. Uh, a really simple one might be something called a SNAP detector. Um, shown here is uh, the design for that SNAP. This is the SNAP-2 detector. There's several versions of it. This has two helium tubes in it, so pretty simple, surrounded by some polyethylene, a cylinder, a cylinder of polyethylene. This is maybe about 12 or 13 centimeters in diameter here. And then this detector is a directional detector, so it has some shielding around the outside. So here's a layer of polyethylene for shielding. And so that makes the efficiency much better to see out the front of the detector than the back. And, and shown here is, is a, a radial directional sensitivity to this detector. So here's the front, and this is shown in the front here. Here's the center of my detector. Um, and this is supposed to be the response is, is, you know, eight times bigger than at the back. This plot here, I think, was made with a pretty low energy neutron source, maybe not representative of what, say, a plutonium spectrum would be. So the fact polyethylene actually reflects them back into the fusion and then Is that correct? I didn't mention, but I'm pretty sure this detector has a cadmium shield around it. Yeah. Right mm -hmm. around here. Yeah. So neutrons coming from here will be moderated and captured in that cadmium. Oh, and can't get into my detector, whereas neutrons coming this way will still be high enough energy they go through the cabinet and okay. then get moderated in the point eight meaning the cadmium layer. Yes, right there. Right. Good eye. <laughs> um, here, this is a picture of one of these SNAP detectors. This is actually the third generation design. And these, you know, these detectors are made to be portable. They weigh 20 pounds. They're rugged and portable. You can use them inside and outside. Here I say, you know, I saw the brochure of this that a two to one front to back difference. So that's probably with like plutonium or something, plutonium neutron energy spectra. This only uses one uh, helium-3 tube and it's 10 atmospheres. The other counter uses two with eight or four atmospheres. So, um, and then it has several different types of applications for this. Now, if we go at something a little more sophisticated, um, it might be something like a slab detector, although this sort of is very similar to the SNAP detector. Um, it has helium tubes, usually arranged in a slab, or some sort of neutron detection uh, detector. Um, this one has two layers of tubes. Um, they're sort of better, to, better than the SNAP in the sense that they have better efficiency um, this one's made with some directionality also because it has shields around the side. So that way uh, neutrons coming in from the side, you know, don't get detected, but neutrons coming in from the face will. Um, 
This, this detector is used to measure UF6, which is what this one is designed for. It's called the shielded flat counter. Um, the downside, this isn't quite as portable. You know, it's bigger. This is what I call semi-portable. It's mounted on a cart, so you can sort of pull it through your plant and stuff. Um, and then if you go even up to more, you get something maybe like a box counter. A uh, box counter would have uh, every side, it would be a big box, and every side is sort of like a flat detector field with healing tubes. So you get much better efficiency with something like this. You know, you're approaching four pi counting because your sample is totally surrounded by helium C tubes. Um, your efficiencies are much more, um, but it's not very portable. You can shield it a lot better because it's fixed. But, you know, here's a, an example of a calibration curve. This is for uh, uranium fuel. Um, here's our response. So you see you get, you know, thousands of counts of neutrons. So you can get very good statistics um, versus here is the mass in kilograms of our samples. Um, and so, you know, a nice calibration curve for that. Is there anything else there? Yep. Um, I'm going to now just talk about a couple of uh, more specific examples here. And this is a, a, an example of trying to measure how much uh, uranium is, say, in an enrichment hall. And so enrichment hall, this is sort of like a picture of one where each of these circles here is a different enrichment stage. So there's, you know, in, in typically uh, in the past when measurements have been done with this, it's, it's, uh, you have to measure each one of these uh, enrichment stages. And so that can take a really long time. And although they didn't measure all of them, they statistically sampled it to get a sampling. But still, you're talking about a couple of weeks to try to measure something like this. And so the thought was, well, you know, maybe we could somehow use a neutron detector to measure this whole thing at once. And let's just consider this, all these uh, enrichment stages as just one big distributed neutron source. And so we can move a neutron detector through here and measure all this. And so this, this was just developed a couple of years ago. And uh, that's what they did. And so they said, well, well we, have, we have uranium enrichment hall. What is our neutron source? Well, it's US-6. What do we need to consider? Well, spontaneous fission from the U-238, and then the alpha end production from the U-234. Those are the major contributors. You, you can write out the whole term with all the other um, isotopes of uranium. And so, uh, so this was the counter that was made to do that. This is a, a it's sort of like a cross detector. So that way it's insensitive to direction. Neutrons coming from any direction will have about the same efficiency to be measured with this. And, you know, it has helium tubes. This actually has an AMSR shift register, but really they're just counting the scalars. They're just using the scalar feature of this with the computer. And so this thing, you know, mounted on a cart, and so they can roll this through the facility. And so they roll it through this facility down these different cascade lines, and they stop at all these red points and make a measurement. And so now that, that detector was made for, to have a pretty high efficiency so that they can count at these red points for a pretty short amount of time. So they can go through here and measure the count rate in this hall in half a day. And so once you do that, now you have the count rate. So this is, uh, this is the count rate measured in that hall. So here's counts per second uh, versus where they, all, where they are in the hall. So you can see there, you know, the count rates, the maximum count rates are like eight counts per second. But still, you can stop there and count for 10 minutes or 15 minutes or whatever and get a pretty good uh, count. I don't know the exact count times they were using. But now, okay, so now we've got all these counts. Now we have to somehow turn this into a mass. And how do, how do they do that? Well, they, they, after they measure the hall, then they apply a linear calibration curve. And this curve was basically derived from Monte Carlo. So, they Monte Carlo this derived, you know, their calibration curves is from, from calculation. And then once you apply that linear calibration curve, basically you have this, all the uranium within the hall. And so here's just two examples. Two facilities have been measured with this. And the first facility they had a difference of 5.6%, second facility 10%. So that's pretty good and probably is better than what was done with the typical path measurement. Just the general term, 
not related to that, in a specific facility, how much uranium can be in the power? I do not know. A lot. Yes. <laughs> if it's a very large number, that may be... That still is a pretty substantial... Uh, right. Uh, yes. You may miss the significant quantity. Yes. You're right. Uh, okay. What, what was the difference between two facilities? Um, I think there were just two different facilities. I don't know all the details on these, but um, I don't know. You know, why is one five and then one ten? And it might just... I don't know. David Benningfield did all this work, so if you have, if you want details, if you want more than just the five slides, you can talk to him. Here's just another quick example. This is measuring spent fuel waste, okay? This counter hasn't been built, but this is proposed to, uh, to measure spent fuel, and basically what we want to do is to figure out how much plutonium is in this vitrified waste, and so, um, it's proposed to make a detector such as this, which has fission chambers to measure the, just the total count rate. These uh, spent fuel have a lot of gamma rays, so this would have like a big tungsten shield or something to shield away the gamma rays. And basically what you'd be doing is you'd be measuring the uh, neutron rate from uh, curium there. And then basically determine the plutonium from the plutonium-curium ratio, which is uh, something yeah. How do you do this? How do you discriminate the neutrons for curium and plutonium? Curium has such, uh, it has a very short half-life, so oh. that's going to dominate oh. uh, by a lot anything coming from plutonium. The ratio is, must be uh, pretty small. And then uh, basically you just use a linear calibration curve to get between the curium to uh, the total count rate. So basically, you measure total count rate, you use the linear calibration curve to get the curium, and then you use the ratio to get the mass. Um, this detector actually has more to it because it has these other chambers and stuff. I don't really want to go into it, but that you can determine like the new average neutron energy and stuff. And that sort of gives you a little more assurance that somebody's actually bringing out vitrified waste and not something else. Here's another really sort of neat thing, and this is the Integrated Spent Fuel Verification System. And this was made to monitor spent fuel moving through a facility. And so they had helium-3 tubes put in that facility so they could count how many uh, spent fuel assemblies were removed from the power plant and brought to the cooling pond. But somebody said, well, maybe I can use these signals. So this is some time signals, and you can see now we've got some neutrons and no neutrons, so this is a uh, assembly moving by, and so maybe we can use the height or the maximum count rate of this to relate to the burn-up, and so that was done. So uh, they basically just looked at the height of the neutron peak and related that to the burn-up, and what was made was basically a very simple uh, calibration here. Here's the count rate, two calibration parameters, and that's our measured burn-up, and you can see that the declared burn-up burn -up versus the measured burn-up is on a straight line with the slope of one. So that works out pretty well. A little way just to quickly use total counting rates. So in summary, uh, total counting, we can use it for uranium and plutonium. Uh, we're not sensitive to the neutron production mechanism. Detectors often are simple, inexpensive, and portable. Better precision than for coincidence counting. We definitely need administrative controls to ensure the proper material is being assayed, and impurities and multiplication effects uh, need to be accounted for so you don't get by. So that's all I have. Any questions? Thank you. Good job.